I'm Peter Henderson, and this is the Case Against Celtic Boys Club podcast. The founder of Celtic Boys Club has been found guilty of sexual offences against three boys in the 1980s and 1990s. What the case comes down to is whether or not Celtic Football Club are responsible in law for the terrible acts of the paedophiles at the heart of Celtic Boys Club. One by one, he raped them. He raped them systematically. A child has got no chance of getting away from the child abuser. The fear and the, the terror is off the scale. They were all young boys, 14, 15, so nobody was going to really say anything because would they have been believed? Just a warning. This podcast will not be gratuitous, but it will discuss the sexual abuse of children and its consequences. The biggest thing you can do to support the podcast is to follow or subscribe wherever you're listening. The more members of the public that know about this podcast means the more people getting the survivor's message out there. The podcast is free, but it does take a lot of time and effort to make. If you're able to make a small donation to its production, it goes a long way to help. Please follow the link to our Patreon donation site. It's your help that makes this podcast possible. Hello and welcome to episode 7 of the Case Against Celtic Boys Club podcast. You'll remember in episode 6 we spoke with Tom who's a survivor of the notorious convicted paedophile and Celtic scout, Kenneth Divers. Divers was extremely active in the youth football scene in Paisley, a large town close to Glasgow. He was a teacher at the local secondary school and would coach the school's football team. This prolific paedophile was closely connected with Celtic Football Club, who praised his scouting work in their official magazine, The Celtic View. He was also close friends with the ringleaders of the Celtic Boys Club paedophile ring, Jim Torbett and Frank Kearney. Tom, which is not his real name as we have to protect his identity, talks in this episode about how he tried to move on from his abuse by Divers, but because Tom had started to build his own career in football, the vile Divers continued to haunt him. There are some sections of this podcast where the names of individuals and the names of football clubs have been bleeped out to prevent identification of survivors. Tom takes up his story after he'd left school and was playing for a local club where in an awful twist of fate, Devers had just been appointed coach. in as if nothing had happened or nothing had ever been said or done. He would just come in and act normal. But he did seem to have this power over me because that he would do things like drop me if even if I was playing well and if I was a substitute, he would put me on and take me back off 10 minutes later on. He had that control. And the guys just... I used to look at it and say, why is he doing that? And then he would apologise and say, oh, it was a mistake. But I always felt that was him still trying to control me because he couldn't get me. But what happened was we started to play a series of friendlies with Celtic Boys Club, both in Paisley and at Barrafield. And I remember... Can you explain what, what is Barrafield? Barrafield is, was the official Celtic training ground. And... I understand that, that Jock Steen at one point handed the keys over to Torbett and said, you use that, that's, that's your training ground now. Who's, who's Torbett? Jim Torbett was the guy who started Celtic Boys Club. And he was the manager along with a guy called Frank Kearney that ran the team that my friend played for. And uh, we started to play them in friendlies. We must have played them four or five times either at Paisley but mostly at Barrafield and any time we played them at Barrafield we would then leave there and go to whichever game was on that day if it was a Saturday we'd play them we'd play them in the morning so that we could all go to whatever game was on and we were all let in to, to Parkhead to watch the game Did you ever see 
differs with Torbett and Kearney? Yeah, because at the games we played, they all stood together. Normally, you would have coaches at one side of the park and, and the other coaches with opposition at the other side of the park or at least 20 or 30 yards away from each other. But they all stood together. I knew they were tight. I could see that. But not knowing what was going on at Celtic Boys Club, nothing ever kind of came to light. But when I hear it all now, I see how close they were and how many times they interacted. And they were obviously the guys who were part of this paedophile ring with Divers. Can we talk about the effect it had on you long term? <laughs> Running in front of the car was my first attempt at my life because I didn't want to go to Spain because I didn't know what was going to happen to Spain after spending two hours um, t- you know, touching up against me and rubbing up against me. But then as the years went on, no telling anybody because I was ashamed, I was frightened, people would find out, I was frightened my parents would find out. And then... Later again, after I left, I never saw him again for years. But then I became a scout and I started bumping into him at games because he was scouting for Celtic. And again, we'd be in the middle of a public park in Paisley and he'd come up to me and start talking to me as if nothing had happened or nothing ever happened. And prattle on about this and that and I just wanted to grab a hold of him and punch his face but I couldn't because it was kids, it was parents they they would want to know why I was doing that and then it would all come out and my biggest fear in life was that this come out because I was involved as I was a scout, I was a youth coach youth development coach Part of my job was in partnership with SFA and I was told that I had to help out with the Paisley and District Select. Who was in charge of the Paisley and District Select? Kenny Divers. I had to go in a dressing room, stand there where I'm talking to the, the boys, go and watch games. Uh, I just I can't do this. And I passed it on to a colleague. I just said it was because of you know, other work commitments. But because I always had this fear, it was always there, but I never told anybody for over 30 years. Until one day, or one night in 1995, I got a phone call from a policeman asking me if I had any comments to make about the activities of Kenneth Divers. And because I had a young family at the time, my mum and dad were still living, I was in this quite high-profile position, I denied it. And about a week later, going to play golf with my best friend, he said to me, did you get a phone call from the police? And I said, yes. I said, I didn't know anything as well. And I said, yeah, I was the same. And we never spoke about it again until years later. And that's when I knew him as a victim as well, who Divers had taken to Celtic Boys Club. We're going to take a break for just a moment. But I would like to thank everyone who has followed and subscribed to the podcast. I'd also like to thank the Patreon donors in particular. This podcast is very challenging to make in terms of time and resources, and it's the support of its listeners that allows the message of the Boys Club survivors to reach a wider audience. Welcome back. Remember to subscribe, write a review, a positive one I hope, and follow the podcast on Twitter. Now, let's get back to Tom's story. Then, a very strange thing happened in your football career. You came into contact with one of the leaders of the Celtic Boys Club paedophile ring, Jim Torbett. Another unbelievable twist, which was I started to play football for an amateur team called in the First Division West of Scotland. A good friend of mine who 
sponsored the team and played had a lot of dealings with the trophy centre and he used to buy a lot of his like diaries and things like that and pens to give to customers. So just to make things clear for listeners, the Trophy Centre was a highly successful business set up and owned by Jim Torbett, who founded Celtic Boys Club. Torbett has now been convicted of child sex offences on three separate occasions and is currently in prison. Children were abused by him on Trophy Centre premises and other convicted paedophiles connected to Celtic Boys Club worked at the Trophy Centre for Torbett. In addition to this, two Glasgow Celtic Football Club directors who went on to become Celtic Football Club chairman were directors of the Trophy Centre business. So it's safe to say, isn't it, that the Trophy Centre business is a central feature of this whole scandal involving Celtic Boys Club? Oh, yes. I mean... I've, I watched the Trophy Centre grow from and they had shops in nearly every town and they, they bought over a big factory over at Tory Glen and uh, we'd have to go over and pick up trophies and things and all the stuff, they got all the Celtic business, all the business from, they did all the, the memorabilia and, and um, trophies for Celtic Boys Club, they did all the trophies for Celtic, it was just Celtic through and through. So because Torbett was always hanging about this team, this West of Scotland League team you were now playing for, you must have been able to form some opinion of what kind of character he was. He used to brag to us how his, how his business started. Um, and he was, like a big, he was like a big immature guy. He used to open his back of his car and show his briefcases with £40,000 in a briefcase. It was just... A strange guy, but then I started to hear stories about how he was treating the staff. Staff used to have to take the takings from the trophy centre up to his flat um, over in Springburn. And on one occasion, one of the boys that played in the team, the guys, dropped off. He was a director of the trophy centre, dropped off what he had to drop off. And when Torbett heard his girlfriend was sitting in the car outside, Torbett stood in front of the door and wouldn't let him out for two and a half hours. And that girl sat down there. That's the strange things I was starting to hear about this guy. And then, of course, when it all started to come out about abuse, it all fell into place and it all made sense about the connection between Devers, Torbett and Kearney. And I had a friend that, that played in school with us that went to Celtic Boys Club who left quite abruptly, Celtic Boys Club, and I asked him the question, why did you leave Celtic Boys Club? I'd always thought it was because his dad was putting pressure on him to get a, a contract. He said in his first night at Celtic Boys Club, he was standing in the showers with, with all the boys, and the next thing, Kearney came in, and he was smacking all the guys backside, and he was whipping them with the tools and things like that. That was one of the first things he ever saw at Celtic Boys Club. And he thought, that's not right. So it all really fell into place. The connection with Divers, Kearney and Torbett. Can I go back and ask about the effect that Kenneth Divers has had in your life, Tom? It's taken 50 years of my life. I've lost a home, I've lost my family. I've lost jobs because I couldn't work. I've got into debt. I've had another two attempts at my life since since running in front of the car. I missed my, my son and daughter's teenage years. I remember when I first told my, my wife at that time, it was in 2002, over 30 years since this happened to me because I was having a panic attack in bed one night. I couldn't not tell anybody anymore. I went to a doctor and had to tell them. And then I, I got counselling and I was asked, do I want to deal with my feelings or deal with him? And I chose my feelings. And as it went on, I just deeper into depression. My life was going nowhere. I moved out of the family home, as I say. And 
he has just been in control of my life for over 50 years until I, I started to do CBT treatment. A friend of mine had, who I worked for paid for this treatment and the guy that did it gave me the courage to go to the police in 2015 and finally tell Report Divers. How did you find out he was living abroad and what did you try to do about it? One day I was driving through Paisley and I saw him holding court with two guys outside a pub, laughing and joking. I just drove straight home and I never came out of my bed for two weeks. And that's the way he used to affect me. So when I went to, finally went and reported him, I always thought he stayed in like the Seat Hill area or behind Paisley Grammar that way. But then the police told me that he was not in the country. He had fled or went to live somewhere else. How did that make you feel? It made me wish I'd never opened my mouth because I was never going to get him. But the police had explained to me that they didn't have an extradition contract with this country, but they couldn't tell me where he was. We were guessing, but nobody would ever tell me officially until I met a, jur a journalist who told me they had a friend that met him in a an airport lounge, met him in a, in a lounge flying to the Far East. So I knew then that's where he was. And what did you think then? I thought, why do you go there? Until I heard that he had been challenged in a pub in Paisley. Now, remarkably, I later found out that the guy that had challenged them was my other friend that he took to Celtic Boys Club, who I had totally forgotten in my school years. I told what happened in Dunoon. And when Devers told him in that pub that night that he was going to adopt a 14-year-old Vietnamese boy, I was starting to ask him, why do you want to adopt a wee boy from Vietnam? and he, get, he lambasted him. And I think then, if you match it up, it's around about the same time as Torbett and Kearney were getting, starting to get, the walls were closing in. I think instead of adopting a child from Vietnam, I think he's just decided he'll go there instead. And I think that's the reason he left, because I think the walls were closing in. But everywhere I went, and everybody I spoke to, couldn't tell me anything positive or anything concrete. And I must add, the police were fantastic, who kept me informed. In 2020, who told me that there was two police officers in, what do you call it? It was at lockdown, they were in... Isolation. Isolation to go and get Divers from where he was the following Monday. And I just burst into tears. I couldn't believe it. They'd got him. They were going to get him and bring him home to face justice. And I'm still getting emotional when I think of the moment. The moment that I knew he was coming home and we'd got him. I, I remember actually that you phoned me not long after that. I did. And uh, you told me we've got him. Thank God. And I was so happy for you. Mm -hmm. So Divers was tried and found guilty on all counts and the judge was particularly scathing uh, about his offending and his behaviour during the trial. But can I ask you what your view is on Celtic Football Club and the way that they are handling the biggest child abuse 
scandal and bit of sport, the Celtic Boys Club paedophile ring. Just to be clear, I'm a football guy. I've been professional football for over 30 years. I have no dislike or hatred towards Celtic players and management as a football team. What I can't understand, and it disgusts me, that the people that run Celtic are in denial that Celtic Boys Club had nothing to do with Celtic. It had everything to do with Celtic. They wore their badge, they wore their blazer. There was people who worked for Celtic that ran Boys Club teams. To say that Celtic Boys Club had nothing to do with Celtic is ridiculous when the whole world knows that they were part of it. And all the victims want is for them to acknowledge that and apologise. Torbett was, was chucked out of Celtic Boys Club in Celtic and four years later he comes back in. It just doesn't make sense. And as I say, my hatred is not towards Celtic football team. It's the people that run it. And it, in my opinion, it's all about money. It's all about they are so frightened and worried about they have to pay out money to people that deserve compensation and a wee bit of justice. We've approached Celtic Football Club for a comment. We've received no reply. So that's us come to the end of episode seven. Thank you again for your support and remember to subscribe and follow wherever you get your podcasts. Write a review if you can and remember to follow us on Twitter. And if possible, make a small donation via our Patreon site. Thank you again and I'll speak to you in episode eight.